¿Qué tal? Bienvenidos a esta emisión del programa Pensadores Contemporáneos. El día de hoy nos encontramos con el doctor Perminder Sachtev. Perminder Sachtev viene de Sydney, Australia, y ha desarrollado una brillante carrera como neurocientífico clínico. Él, eh, por un lado, trata pacientes, pacientes con enfermedades del cerebro y de la mente, y por otra parte realiza investigaciones epidemiológicas, investigaciones en el terreno de las neurociencias, acerca del problema del envejecimiento patológico, lo que hoy en día conocemos como enfermedad de Alzheimer, pero también otras eh, enfermedades del envejecimiento que pueden alterar la función cognitiva, la memoria, el lenguaje, la atención, como son la demencia vascular, la enfermedad por cuerpos de Lewy y otras enfermedades de las cuales tendremos oportunidad de hablar con el doctor Perminder Sachtev. Entonces, eh, el doctor Sachtev eh, nos va a regalar una conversación, esta se realizará en inglés, eh, debido a que es la lengua del doctor Sachdev, pero vamos a hacer un recorrido por algunos de los temas que el doctor ha tratado. En primer lugar, algunas cuestiones de su desarrollo personal, profesional, cómo se mete al mundo de las neurociencias y a continuación sus experiencias en la clínica, que son experiencias muy interesantes porque traen historias acerca de cómo es la experiencia de estar enfermo, especialmente cuando es una experiencia que tiene que ver con enfermedades del cerebro y de la mente. Y posteriormente pasaremos a hablar de las investigaciones neurocientíficas del doctor Perminder Sachdev, que conciernen, como hemos dicho, sobre todo al tema del envejecimiento patológico y de cómo podemos prevenir, si es que podemos prevenir, estos problemas de, eh, conocidos cotidianamente como demencia, es decir, como la pérdida de la función cognitiva que sobreviene en etapas avanzadas de la vida. Entonces, eh, pues iniciaremos con la conversación. Hi, Dr. Sachdev, how are you? I'm very well. I apologize for not being able to speak in Spanish. Oh, don't worry. We'll, we'll, we'll use the language of Shakespeare that is quite sure, rich absolutely. language anyway. So, um, Dr. Sachdev, we're very uh, happy that you're uh, now, nowadays with us in, in Mexico, offering different kind of uh, academic experiences. And um, in this conversation for this uh, TV program, we would like to deal with, an, with um, a number of topics. Sure. No? But uh, perhaps uh, so the, uh, the public can know a, a little about you. I would uh, like to ask you if you could uh, tell us a little bit how did you get involved into medicine and then uh, clinical neuropsychiatry? W what was the pathway that led you to that uh, ground? So I guess I was born in India. Okay, and, uh, thank you. As you know, uh, very often in India, when you're young, you don't make your decisions. Your parents make your decisions for you. Mm -hmm. and in fact, for me, going into medicine was kind of predetermined. My parents said, oh, this is, kid is going to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. So in fact, I was very young when I went to, uh, went to medicine. But I also had an interest in philosophy and literature at that time. And when I went through medicine, I found the whole subject of medicine a bit dry. And I was attracted to psychiatry because it was one area where you could explore the mind. Uh, and uh, therefore, in fact, even my third and fourth year of, of medicine, I started reading about psychiatry and I went to psychiatry soon after I finished my training in medicine in Delhi. And uh, then, of course, when I, I went to psychiatry for a few years, for three or four years, I realized that uh, I did have a scientific bend, really, that I wanted to use very strict scientific principles to explore the human mind. And you found that the general psychiatry was really not uh, very prone to didactic science in a way. And I uh, actually was drawn towards neuropsychiatry as a discipline which applied very scientific principles uh, uh, to the study of the human mind. So it's actually, it was an evolution in that sense of okay. going from medicine to psychiatry to neuropsychiatry. And I haven't looked back because it has been a fascinating area for now 30 years or so. Th 30 yeah. years. Yeah. So yeah. now you, you bring the problem of um, neuropsychiatry, of the brain on one hand and the mind in the other. So um, I understand that you had this uh, early interest in philosophy and literature. 
And we know that this uh, mind-brain uh, problem has been there for a, for a very long while. I, I think it has going been... Going back to the Greeks, I going think. Going back to the Greeks. Yeah. So I would like uh, for, for this, uh, in, in the first moment, to perhaps uh, deal a little with that kind of uh, problem. What is your, uh, your pe personal opinion on that uh, perspective, of that problem, the, the mind-body problem or the brain-mind uh, problem? No. How does the, ma the mind emerge from, from the yeah. brain? So, in fact, see, uh, my position is that of neuroscientist, and I believe that all mental phenomena are neural phenomena. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, it is possible that underlying one particular mental phenomena, there may be several uh, different neural phenomena. But the problem, of course, is that it's very difficult at this stage for us to bridge the gulf between what happens at the neural level that we can study and what happens at the mental level. And perhaps, in fact, that's very akin to the hard problem of consciousness as to how does that emerge from the, from the brain. We do know that when a certain system reaches a level of complexity, that certain properties emerge in that system which cannot be explained solely on understanding of the individual parts of that system. And to some extent, the, the brain is like that. It's a very complex system. And the complexity generates the, the cognitions, the emotions, the behaviors that we recognize as being mental phenomena in a way. But it, maybe it will never be possible to fully understand how the gulf is actually bridged between the two. Of course. And um, on one extreme, we have uh, like radical materialist positions yeah. no? that uh, think that even the concept of consciousness, free will, uh, personal freedom, or um, uh, feelings, all of that are just words that will eventually lose their meaning because the only thing that exists is the object of the brain with its um, uh, kinds of activity, you no know, biological activity, chem <coughs> chemical activity. And on the other hand, we have uh, other kinds of uh, radicalisms, no? like, uh, for instance, spiritual radicalism yeah, yeah, that think sure. that the mind has nothing, nothing to do with the brain, that the mind can persist like a, uh, like a spirit or, or a soul after death. No? Yeah. Uh, but w what would be your, your position, position between those yeah. two uh, So I would say that I would be closer to the materialist end, really, of the spectrum. I do not believe that we need to invoke any spirituality. Okay. We do not need to evoke another force or power from outside to explain the human mind. I think it does lie in the brain. Of course, I understand the brain not just as the piece of flesh sitting in the skull, because the brain is interacting with the environment, the inter is interacting with the body. So you have to understand the brain as an organ that is an interactive organ and a malleable, flexible, changing, dynamic kind of organ. Uh, but I think the mental phenomena are emerging from that. But I don't think we are ever going to be able to fully understand the, the, the transformation of that neural phenomenon to a mental phenomenon, I think. Okay. And, and there are perhaps a uh, couple of reasons for that. One is, of course, the level of complexity of that yeah. organism. I think we perhaps do not have the abilities uh, or the capacity as human beings to understand that complexity to some degree. And also, uh, I suppose the other aspect is that as human beings, we are looking from within, trying to understand ourselves, really. And that is a kind of a difficult aspect, really, because I think if you're looking from within, you cannot be totally objective of, uh, in, in being able to understand some phenomenon. So I think it, we will never be that close to radical materialism, that everything can be explained on the basis of neural mechanisms. Okay. Really. There will always be room for mental phenomena, and there'll be, of course, there is this richness in mental phenomena that cannot be captured with neural phenomena, and that's really what give us, gives us our humanity, in a way. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, something that concerns uh, large proportions of the public that reads uh, science materials and other kind of materials and um, is, is the issue of uh, religious topics sure. and also uh, moral concerns, no? Ethical okay. thought. So um, for some people, the, these uh, ethical principles come from religious uh, texts, no? Like uh, mystical revelations coming from sacred texts. So I would ask you the same question that has been asked to other to other scientists that are 
closer to the materialism spectrum. Where do you think these uh, ethical principles arise if, if they do not arise from sacred texts or revelations of another realm? Yeah. So I, I think uh, you're right that religion has uh, to some degree given many societies a more moral code really and it has been important for many societies to have that moral code. But I do not think that it is absolutely necessary to have religion, to have morality. Because my feeling is that morality actually emerges when uh, human beings come together. And it's that formation of society and to live uh, with each other in a harmonious fashion, you need a moral code. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that moral code directs your behavior uh, to some degree towards each other. And that emerges in any society, any group that forms, there is a certain moral code emerges. Mm -hmm. And of course, the famous uh, notion of uh, do unto others as you would want others to do to you, that kind of principle actually the permeates Gordian rule, of Gordian rule really. That mm -hmm. permeates all societies really, because that will lead to harmonious living. And in fact, if even you go back, go down to some primate uh, so, uh, colonies as well, where there mm -hmm. is a kind of a social, uh, gathering. There are some principles even there that you can deduce. Of course, you, you can only deduce from those observations. So, in fact, it probably is not restricted to humans. Uh, there is even, even in the apes, for example, there is a certain degree of a core, social code, which we may or may not call a mor moral code in that sense. But I think it's a coming together of individuals, and that's what human society has been like. It's, it's uh, actually evolved as a, uh, we've evolved as social beings. And so, morality is part of that. So, so you think that in a way we can track down in um, biological evolution to, to the uh, emergence of this moral or ethical principle? Yeah, I think there, is, there, are, there are aspects of that that we can see in animals as well. We can see empathy, for example, empathy. in animals. Can you yeah. put any examples perhaps of, of uh, compassion or um, uh, altruism in, yeah. in animals. So, species. in fact, there's some very good examples. Even in, uh, uh, of course, we we talk about chimpanzees and apes when mm -hmm. you look at societies. But even actually looking at other animals, uh, there is uh, the animal called the prairie vole, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, prairie voles uh, mate very early in life, and then they actually maintain mateship throughout life. So they are very loyal to their mate. Yes. And you find that uh, if you actually uh, they did an experiment in which they put uh, two prairie lords, two mates in separate cages, mm -hmm. and they shocked one uh, of the wolves in one of the cages, and then brought the other wall in, and they found that the the wall, who was another case, saw uh, her mate being shocked, actually consoled that mate for about ten minutes okay. or so, and consoling is by grooming and uh, licking, etc. Okay. Really, and. Uh, and this, this seems to be somewhat innate. This, this happens in these, these animals. And, uh, and uh, it's a very important discovery was that uh, it was often related to uh, the uh, pouring out of a hormone called mm -hmm. oxytocin. oxytocin. And in fact, when you knocked out the mm -hmm. oxytocin gene in these animals, the consoling, this kind of behavior was significantly disrupted. Yeah. So, and in fact, we know that oxytocin is uh, an important hormone in humans as well. And uh, bonding between a mother and a child, they're lactating mothers have the flow of oxytocin. Uh, and uh, that kind of bonds the mother to the child. And we think that maybe affiliative behaviors otherwise also are affected uh, by oxytocin. And uh, there is, there's been even a suggestion that individuals who are uh, say autistic or uh, belong to the autistic spectrum disorder may have some deficiency in either oxytocin or in the action or effect of oxytocin in the brain. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, people have tried to use oxytocin as a treatment mm -hmm. for autism as well. So there is a certain biology that under, underlies many of these behaviors, but I think they come together in maturity in a social society, in a, a, a harmonious large society such as humans have formed. That, that is very, very interesting, doctor. And um, perhaps this has uh, something to do with what some neuroscientists called uh, the emotional brain or the, the, the limbic system that I would like uh, later on to, to sure. go um, to that uh, territory because you deal a lot with uh, patients, no? yeah, with exactly. clinical yeah. experiences in which uh, we can see the effects of lesions 
and, and, and brain disease in those particular areas of the brain. But before coming to that, uh, I would like to go uh, a step back to your personal history. You okay. were telling us that uh, you, um, you went to, uh, from India to, to Australia, right? So I, I wanted to make a comment and th that you also uh, write l l like um, different kinds of uh, products of literature. Like this is a book about the experiences of, uh, of a migrant, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a book of, uh, of poetry. And uh, I think that you have dealt with these problems also from um, a, a perspective that is sometimes called ethnopsychiatry. You, you um, I think you had some experiences on, on that and particularly studying human groups like the Maoris in, in New Zealand. Um, can you tell us a little about that, those uh, experiences that are part also of, sure. of your professional okay. scope? Yeah. So, See, in fact, I, uh, I was over 25 when I moved to New Zealand. Actually, yes. in fact, I first went to New Zealand from New Delhi. And uh, it just so happened that I took up a job. I applied for various jobs, and I, they offered me a job in Auckland. And I took up a job there. And I worked in a psychiatric hospital for some time, and then a psychiatric unit in the main hospital, the general hospital in New Zealand. And I was struck by the fact that uh, there was, uh, of course, when you come from a different culture, and this was the first time I'd moved out of India, so I encountered a new culture. And of course, you see both some similarities and as, as well as some differences. And you can actually look at a culture from outside. And I could also see, of course, uh, New Zealand is not a very uniform society. Like It's largely white Caucasian society, but there is a significant Maori population that, in fact, the Maori have been present there for over eight, a thousand years a thousand in New Zealand. New Zealand. Okay. And they are a thriving population. Yeah, they, they have uh, maintained some of their cultural practices. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, when you actually go to rural areas, they uh, in fact have more uh, traditional practices as well. And they had certain uh, belief systems that actually guided their behaviors, which was really not obvious to uh, a Caucasian New Zealander called the Pakeha. Uh, and in fact, I was, uh, in fact, quite surprised that many of the white Caucasian psychiatrists were not very familiar with the Maori practices because I think they probably had grown up in that society and they had really not paid much attention. But uh, coming from outside, I could see the contrast. Mm -hmm. And I started becoming interested in some aspects of Maori culture which influenced their behavior and also their psychiatric presentation to some extent. So I looked at uh, a few cultural concepts such as mana tapu, and also another concept called hakama, which uh, essentially is like shame and embarrassment, which is a very strong concept okay. within Maori culture. And I also looked at the, uh, how a Maori elder deals with a younger person in terms of uh, a therapeutic interaction, and how that is different from a, a psychotherapist-patient interaction. But I think that even though I did not stay on with ethno mm -hmm. but uh, my interest in culture remained really and and I think that was because as an outsider you you even though you become assimilated in a new culture to some degree you can speak the language I've been working in Australia now for 30 years uh, and my children were born there uh, so you think that you're assimilated but still you feel that there is one part of you that uh, is probably still alien mm -hmm. and I think as you grow older that becomes really comes more to the focus and that's really what happened and prompted me to write these poems uh, in the last few years. Because there are, of course, there are some memories of the past that, and in fact, the human mind, human mind is uh, peculiar in that we preserve some memories and we also transform some memories of the past. And we actually sometimes forget, uh, I mean, it happens both ways, but uh, for in my case, you, you often remember the, the the better, the nicer memories, the ones mm -hmm. that had a, a lasting impact on you. And you, you have uh, uh, and a rosy eyed and a rosy tinted view of, uh, of the past to some degree. Yeah. There is, is nostalgia, nostalgia also mm -hmm. of perhaps going back. And there's also a pull of family left behind. And there is guilt of having left behind uh, people that you probably perhaps could have helped if you stayed on. So all these emotions come to you, and especially in the dead of night when you're thinking about the past. And, 
it's probably one way of expressing that is through poems, I think. Yeah. So, so in, in this case, poetry would be a, um, a form to express all those Absolute. emotions. Absolutely, no? yeah, absolutely. Those, those, those feelings that... Um, and they're very conflicting emotions sometimes. And, okay. Yeah. There are conflicting emotions. And, um, well, I would like to deal with that because I remembered uh, some words of uh, Professor uh, Emmanuel Sifneos, who would say that a creative person is one that can deal with complexity, but also with contradictory views yeah. and unify them in, in, in a form of, uh, of a, new, a new meaning, a new formula or something. And uh, in that sense, uh, um, artistic creation is that kind of uh, synthesis, perhaps. Yeah, I think so. I think that that's quite true. And it, it kind of, it's uh, also gives you, it's, it's an expression, really. And it deals with some pain that you might feel within, really. Even though it, it does not change anything, mm -hmm. you still have the nostalgia. You still know that this experience has, you've gone through and there's, there are things that you've lost. And of course, you've gained certain things by moving. It doesn't change the reality. But it certainly, I think, gives an expression to your inner feelings, definitely. Go, going back even all the way to the, to the Greeks, the, there is this old, um, this old uh, writings, by, uh, supposedly by Aristotle, no? in which he links the melancholia with, with crea creativity. Yeah, creativity no? yeah. and so sometimes, and nowadays, there's still this relationship, right? Yeah, I think so. I think, I mean, you do find that people with mood disorder, especially bipolar disorder, mm -hmm. we see that uh, often they have periods of creativity. And we've seen many writers who actually suffer from bipolar disorder. We know very famous writers who had severe depression, and that Dostoevsky, for example, is well known to have severe depression, and he wrote some of his work while he was very depressed. And you can see that in, in Crime and Punishment, you see the pain, actually, that certainly has to be someone who'd experienced it himself at some stage. One, once again, it's a, a moral feeling, no? that, that, that guilt, that pain, in, in the case of, of Dostoevsky in, in Crime and, and Punishment. Uh, although we, we know that Dostoevsky had this strong um, Christian uh, culture, but you were dealing um, uh, minutes ago with the concept of guilt or embarrassment in the Maori culture, wh where it does not come from Christianity, right? No, no, it... it Christi it actually predates Christianity. Christianity was, a, it was introduced to New Zealand only about 200 years ago or so. So this goes back a long way. Once yeah. again, we, we deal and with this it, moral yeah, brain that's right, that could yeah. be... But I think Maori culture is, is very interesting in that there were a lot of emotions that were uh, very conducive to harmonious living. To, uh, so this was basically, this wakam or embarrassment came someone who had broken the rules a young, young person broke broken the rules of society. Mm -hmm. And then he had to hide away. He could not show his, shame, uh, his face mm -hmm. in society. And he had to go through some rituals to, count, to be brought back into society in a okay. way. Yeah. So it kind of helped control uh, behavior generally in society. And it was a, a kind of a moral code, if you can say that. Now, um, you, you have uh, speaking uh, now from um, different aspects of culture in the, in the Maoris. And I think that in your later work, uh, for instance, in your um, scientific work in the field of uh, neurological and psychiatric epidemiology, you deal a lot with uh, socioeconomic structures that uh, might be um, influencing the ways of life of people that can have healthy aging or pathological aging. So I would like to come later on to that topic. topic. Sure. But, um, once again, going back to your, your development, um, you, you established in, first in New Zealand and then in Australia, where you worked as a clinical psychiatrist and a, and a neuropsychiatrist, which is a, a form of sub-specialization specializa in which um, the clinician uh, has to um, make uh, investigations, research of the neurological problems of the patient, but also the mind and behavior problems. Sure. So um, we understand you wrote uh, another book uh, on, on this topic, The Jeeping Tiger and Other, and other Tales from the Clinic. So um, I think that this book uh, in some ways um, is um, a synthesis, uh, uh, summarizes some of your m m experiences as a clinician. Can you tell us a little about this, uh, this book, how yeah. it came to life? So essentially, see, I, 
I have been working at the Neuropsychiatric Institute in the Prince of Wales Hospital in Sydney. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a tertiary referral unit. So we get patients referred from all over the state mm -hmm. with various uh, challenging problems, often at the interface of psychiatry and neurology. So you're dealing with disturbances in behavior or emotion or thinking, but with a brain basis, with an organic basis uh, in terms of a lesion. And when you look at each patient, each patient uh, offers you a window into the mind or the way the mind works or the way the brain works in, in relation to uh, the production of emotion or uh, cognition. Yeah. So I thought that this was perhaps one way of actually uh, communicating how the brain works to look at uh, cases, a few select cases, one by one. And I picked uh, about 10 cases which I describe and then see mm -hmm. how these phenomena could have been generated by the brain and what that, how that explains how the brain might function. Yeah. So uh, the yipping tiger, in fact, uh, the title comes from the word yips, mm -hmm. which is uh, something golfers dread, really, especially elite golfers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because uh, this from some, golf. Yeah, yeah, this is from golf, really. Okay. And there were some very famous golfers like Sam Snead, mm -hmm. uh, Bernard Langer, who were at, at the top of the game. And then suddenly what happens is they start missing the short strokes, the putts. The, the short, short strokes. Short strokes, not usually. The large not, the, not the long strokes, yeah. Okay. The short strokes. And that's when they're close to the hole and they have to, what they call, sink the putt, really, mm -hmm. uh, using a putter, which is uh, uh, the golf club, yeah. And what happens is that when they reach there, it's a very fine stroke, and they've usually practiced this for hours and hours every day for years, really. So they really masters at this. But suddenly when they're there, either they, the stance freezes or they have a slight jerk or a shake in their hand. And often you send, they may start with a three foot putter, a putt and then end up with a 15 foot. Mm -hmm. uh, so, they, and, and it actually, because that's where you win tournaments by putting well really. So often uh, the, uh, some of them had to drop uh, from uh, many tournaments as a consequence of that. And uh, so it's peculiar and it's, it's reminiscent of other uh, kinds of what we call task specific dystonias. Mm -hmm. So these usually affect tasks that are highly practiced. For example, uh, some uh, scribes who used to write a lot, write mm -hmm. many hours every day, often sitting outside the law office. Mm -hmm. This is before typewriters came mm -hmm. along. People used to write for hours. They would develop a writer's cramp. Mm -hmm. So as soon as they held a pen, the hands would go into a cramp. And, uh, but the hand was otherwise fine for yeah. other tasks. In fact, they could do fine movements with the task. They would eat well, they could shave their beards and they could uh, play a piano or things like that. That was fine, but as soon as they held a pen, it goes into a spasm. So you wonder what goes on in the brain mm -hmm. in that uh, it affects only one particular task and that's a highly practiced task. And, and uh, our, our thinking is that it is probably related to some brain circuits and some kind of programs that have developed uh, for highly practiced tasks, which have become automated in a way. We don't have mm -hmm. to think about these, it just happened. Like when we write, we don't have to think how we're writing, we just write because it's a kind of automatic activity. And that's because some regions of the brain start forming these programs. And it's probably a disruption of those specific programs, those specific regions of the brain that lead to the star specific dystonia. And there are similar examples of other cases. Uh, there, there are examples of a patient in which uh, uh, we tried to treat his epilepsy by producing a surgical lesion. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a lesion which disconnects the two hemispheres. Yes. And there is a bundle of fibers that connects the two hemispheres called the corpus callosum, which yes. has about 200 to 300 million fibers. And you c disconnect that. And actually that stops the patient from having a generalized seizure. So they stop falling okay. and hurting themselves. Uh, and, and we found that uh, it's been an interesting uh, kind of journey, this, and this is not uh, something new. This has been known for quite some time, and this surgery has been around for uh, many, uh, several decades. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, some of these patients have been studied to see whether we can actually be disconnecting their brains, so we actually are we creating two consciousness, uh, uh, the left hemisphere consciousness and the right hemisphere consciousness. But it's very interesting in this patient that 
uh, following this surgery, he developed an inability to control his hand for some activities. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even though there was no weakness in the left hand and he could uh, do most uh, tasks reasonably, but he could not write with his left hand anymore. And when he was act, uh, doing something with his right hand, for example, he picked a, a cup of water to bring to his mm -hmm. mouth, the left hand would come and grasp his right hand and interfere with that activity. It wouldn't let... It wouldn't let the, the right hand do the activity. Yeah. In fact, at one point it was clasping the, the, hand, the right hand so uh, fiercely that we had to actually pull them apart uh, with force. So it's a, it's, it's a syndrome that has been described previously. It's called the alien hand syndrome. The alien hand. Yeah. yeah. So, and in fact, there is uh, one movie. I don't know whether you've uh, come across that movie. It's called Dr. Strangelove. Dr. Strange. And it's a Stanley, Stanley Kubrick, Kubrick movie. Of course, yeah. In which Peter Sellers has uh, this left hand. He has a glove on his hand. And this left hand does not obey him. So he does things that he doesn't necessarily mean to do, really. And it's a... It's a it's an anarchic hand, really. Yeah, like uh, a uh, cinematographic alien uh, hand alien syndrome. hand syndrome in that sense. Fortunately, it only for short lived. Really, gradually it settled, and he he got back full control over his hand. But it actually basically makes us think as to how does the brain generate movement, and how does the brain generate coordination of different parts of the body, mm -hmm. so that, uh, uh, for example, when we want to move your right hand, you only move your right hand, and only to a certain degree. So that, that kind of generation of movement is something that it, it makes, makes you think about, really. And we often find that, in fact, the planning of movement before you actually do a movement starts uh, a few uh, milliseconds uh, before you're actually even aware that you're going to do the movement. And that planning starts in both sides of the brain. And, but then one side of the brain will tell the other side, look, stop this. If you want to move only the right hand, the le right side of the brain has to be suppressed so that the left hand, left hand side will give the command for the right hand to move. Because we know that left half the brain controls the right hand and the right half the brain controls the left hand. So uh, you need a connection between the two hemispheres for uh, uh, proper coordination of, of the two, two hands to occur. And if you disconnect the two mm -hmm. hemispheres, it's possible that you can actually make the two interfere with each other. And, and, the, and the left hand is being commanded by the right hemisphere, which doesn't have language. Mm -hmm. So it cannot communicate, really, what, why this is, uh, why your brain cannot communicate why the left hand is moving. So it seems as if it's uh, without any purpose, uh, and it's not as part of your consciousness. That's why it has this aspect of... Anarchy or anarchy. anarchy. Yeah, yeah, that's Perhaps right. it cannot communicate or codify its mental that's states. That's right. That's right. And uh, this brings us to the to the topic of uh, brain connectivity. No, uh, brain communication within within different uh, cerebral um, networks. Yeah. And uh, I think that your later work has dealt a lot with uh, some disorders that uh, provoke uh, different kinds of disturbances in that, in that connectivity. For instance, uh, vascular lesions, no? Yeah. That often uh, these vascular lesions, l lesions provoked by um, different kind of vascular disease in the brain would provoke different, all kinds of disconnection between, uh, between frontal lobes and other parts of the brain. So they would perhaps pro produce a different range of um, cognitive and behavioral uh, so this brings us to the topic of, of demen dementia, dementia, no? yeah. dementia, vascular dementia, or also uh, degenerative dementia. Now, you you were in the um, the committee that um, changed the criteria for for dementia uh, in the American Psychiatric Association, the famous DSM manual. So um, nowadays, uh, in in the manual, it doesn't appear any longer as with that name, dementia. Uh, the, the, you, it appears now as um, major neurocognitive disorder, right? So, so can, well, it's optional. optional. You can it's optional. use either dementia or major neurocognitive disorder. As can, can you explain a little um, what, what does this mean? What, what is this disorder for our audience? So, so broadly speaking, we should say that uh, we have a lot of people who have cognitive impairment. And when we talk about cognitive impairment, we're talking about functions such as memory or language 
or your ability to reason and think uh, and plan activities, we call frontal executive ability, mm -hmm. or map the environment or navigate yourself, that's called visual spatial ability, uh, or work appropriately in society in terms of interacting with other, in other individuals as part of social cognition. So these are the cognitive activity uh, okay. functions that uh, all of us have. And we know that there are many disorders of the brain that can affect these cognitive abilities. And uh, the best known example of that is Alzheimer's disease, I guess. Uh, uh, but uh, we, we know that there are perhaps uh, several, maybe over a hundred different causes. If you go to a textbook of neurology, you'll find that over a hundred different causes of cognitive disturbance that can occur in, in people. This has become especially important lately because of the aging of the population. We know that uh, uh, many cognitive disorders are age related and as you grow older, the risk for developing cognitive disorders uh, increases. Now, the term dementia has been used for a long period of time and essentially it has meant that there is a decline in a person's abilities, cognitive abilities from previous level down to a level when they can no longer look after themselves. That's really been the broad concept of dementia. <laughs> and uh, previously, as if you go back to say to the 19th century, it was thought that it was largely atherosclerotic, that the thick arteries in the brain were thickening and blood supply was coming down. And that's the, that was the reason that uh, uh, dementia was occurring. And it was related to aging, so often it was referred to as senility as well but we know that it's not the same as aging. It's a disease, really. It doesn't happen in all people as they grow older, but it's only some people, and it's, it's a disease, although age-related uh, problem. And then, of course, in the 20th century, uh, there was initially a realization earlier on in the 20th century that there could be specific diseases that cause this, and Alzheimer's disease was one of the diseases that was described in the early part of the 20th century. But only in the later part of the 20th century, in the 60s, did we realize that this was not a rare disease, that it was common. Mm -hmm. And many older brains had pathology, which was uh, recognized as Alzheimer's type pathology. And then since then, I think in the last 30 to 40 years, increasingly there's been a recognition that Alzheimer's disease may be the most common cause of dementia. And to some degree that, in fact, the term dementia was, uh, has begun to be used almost synonymously with Alzheimer's disease. But we recognize that it, it is probably the most common cause of dementia, but it's not the only cause of dementia. And there is a lot of variety in which cognitive disorders presented. So in fact, to get away from that confusion of uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease, uh, we thought that uh, perhaps using the term neurocognitive disorder uh, was a more generic term, really, which will encompass all kinds of problems. We know that people with traumatic brain injury develop cognitive problems, mm -hmm. people with HIV AIDS, for example, people with uh, uh, epilepsy have cognitive problems. There are so many different kinds of causes mm -hmm. of uh, cognitive disorders. So, so neurocognitive disorder is a broad term, really. And then we also know that uh, even though dementia is one extreme, there are many people who have mild cognitive problems that do not meet criteria for dementia. They can still look after themselves but they're not as efficient as they previously used to be, or they have to make an extra effort to do certain things. And those are the people who are often referred to as mild cognitive impairment or mild neurocognitive disorder. So this is the approach DSM has taken, that you have a kind of an overview of uh, neurocognitive disorder, an umbrella term. Mm -hmm. And then within that, you have specific diseases, like Alzheimer's disease, and you have specific criteria for Alzheimer's disease, specific criteria for vascular cognitive disorder, specific criteria for frontotemporal dementia, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, let's say that we have now a history of more than 100 years since um, Alzheimer, Al Al Alzheimer described yeah. the, the first patient, uh, uh, the, this woman that had this form of, of uh, cognitive impairment. And since then, we have um, progressed a lot um, uh, making research in our understanding, into yeah, the yeah. science of, of uh, cognitive decline, but we still cannot cure most cases of cognitive decline. So uh, perhaps we can prevent them. 
So uh, th this would be one of the last topics I would like yeah, to, sure. to, to deal, deal with here in this interview. Um, can you tell us about the, the, the research uh, that is being done, perhaps even by your, your group there in Sydney? Uh, how is this research done? Uh, because it's a very large process, no? Yeah. Uh, it's not cheap, it's not easy, it's not fast, no? So perhaps if you can tell us a little, how is this research done? And uh, what are the, the understandings we have nowadays of how can we prevent um, cognitive de decline? So I think the, the first point to make is that because many of these disorders uh, are age-related, so the best way to study any age-related disorder is to follow people up as they age. So what we and others, many groups around the world have done is that we have cohorts of individuals. So we actually select a population Uh, or a randomly select a population uh, of people, say a thousand people or two thousand or five thousand people, and we, uh, when they're normal, they are not cognitively impaired at that time, and we study them over a period of time. So in our case, we're doing a study called a membrane aging study, where we assess people every two years. So we look at them neuropsychologically, they look at their medical profiles, we look, we take the blood samples, we we'll, uh, do various investigations with blood samples, we look at their genetics. We do brain imaging on them. And then we uh, actually look at the ones who will eventually develop dementia mm. so over several years. So one study has been going on for 12 years. 12 so there are other studies that are going on for much longer as well, really. So that's really, I think, one way to prospectively examine what, uh, how, what predisposes some individuals to developing dementia as opposed to others who escape dementia. And we then look at the risk factors as a consequence. And then of course, what we want to do is, once we identify the risk factors, we want to say, okay, now if we modify these risk factors, will it prevent dementia? So you take another group of people and randomly assign one group where you modify a risk factor and have the control group, and then you study them over two or three or five years and see whether the modification of the risk factor actually has led to a reduction in uh, the co in the production of in the incidence of dementia which basically is the final proof that yes this is really a risk factor so it, it's in in the case of dementia one of the difficulties of course has been that dementia takes a very long time to develop and we think that uh, if you now have a patient say who's 70 and has dementia it's quite likely that the pathology started 30 years ago or 40 years ago and has gradually accumulated so we should be looking at midlife, really, or even earlier. Okay. And we know there are more, many modifiable factors. Uh, we know there are the vascular risk factors. We recognize uh, like high blood pressure, mm -hmm. diabetes, right. obesity, smoking, high cholesterol. We know these are risk factors for heart disease. We know there is factor for stroke, mm -hmm. but we also know that there is factor for dementia. And not only vascular dementia, we think there are risk factors for Alzheimer's disease as well, really, they increase the risk. So that's, and we should be trying to do something about this in midlife, and even earlier, actually, at an early age, and through, uh, see that we control these risk factors for the whole population as best as we can. Then there are some factors we think are factors that increase your brain reserve. And the concept is that many people, we find that, uh, in fact, Uh, so there are some individuals who come, we uh, look at them after they die at autopsy, we said that the brain may have a lot of pathology, and yet they were functioning normally in life, really. Mm -hmm. So there is something about their brains which gives them resilience, and that's been referred to as brain reserve. Brain reserve. Yeah, and uh, that's a very important concept, and I think this, and we know that there are certain things that increase your brain reserve. One is education. Mm -hmm. One, the other is physical activity, physical exercise. That's something we really emphasize, is physical exercise throughout your life. Cognitive activity, so staying mentally engaged, like conversations like this, and challenging your brain, uh, and uh, doing, learning new things, uh, say learning to dance, learning to uh, speak a new language, uh, uh, reading and engaging yourself all the time. That's very important for brain reserve. And also social engagement, we think, is important. Uh, so these are the factors, I think, which increase your resilience uh, against, uh, and they may postpone the development of dementia, if not prevent it. Yeah. And then, of course, treating depression and managing stress, I think, is the other thing. And we also emphasize, of course, uh, other lifestyle measures like uh, moderation in alcohol use. Mm -hmm. So excess use of alcohol is bad, really. 
we also uh, do recommend that uh, prevention of head injury is important. So wearing the seat belt, for example, when you're driving a car or even riding a car uh, and uh, football injuries, preventing those. So those are the kinds of uh, things that at a population level we should be doing. Uh, and then looking at nutrition and diet and uh, a good balanced diet uh, and uh, often diet. I mean, I think it's a Mexican diet is a very, very balanced uh, diet. I think it <laughs> often derives from what has been called the Mediterranean diet. It really yes. comes, originates from that. And the Mediterranean diet has had a lot of uh, uh, study uh, done on it. And there's good evidence now that it probably is protective for the brain, just as it's good for the heart, also good for the brain. Excellent. So there are, um, there are different um, possibilities of preventing particular uh, risk uh, factors in order to prevent uh, different kinds of, of dementia. Yeah. Is that right? In, in particular, vascular dementia vascular. And, and Alzheimer's disease Alzheimer's. to some degree. Really. Not, not the other. There are some dementias we do not understand fully yet in terms of their etiology. If like there is the dementia with Lewy bodies, mm -hmm. we do not understand the development of that very much. So I don't think we have any risk factors that we recognize in particular for dementia with Lewy bodies. With um, frontotemporal dementia, again, something that we do not uh, fully understand in terms of risk factors. We know that genetics is important and there's not a lot we can do about genetics at this point, really. So there is a, a, a large um, genetic component in yeah. much... Um... There is, uh, certainly for some dementias, dementias that occur earlier in life, so before, the, before the age of 65, we often refer to them as pre-senile dementias. Mm -hmm. uh, um, we know that genetics is much, very important in early onset dementias. But even in the later onset dementias, we know, we think that, uh, for example, Alzheimer's disease, we think that genetics is important. Uh, some studies show that maybe 60% uh, of uh, the contribution or even more may be contributed by genetics. And at this point, we only recognize a small proportion of that in terms of the genes that may be contributing to it. And it's not one gene, it's a, a number of different genes making small effects. Now, um, I remember a, a paper you, you wrote, I don't remember exactly uh, the journal, if it was Psychological Medicine or other, in which you uh, dealt with these risk factors, but more re uh, related to um, kinds of um, cultural stimulation to, to, the, to the individual. So for instance, in, in another study, uh, they, um, and I think it was a British uh, study that they found out that the mm, principal ways to prevent in that study uh, dementia in people in old age were four uh, particular activities. One was uh, reading, other was writing, the other was, I think, dancing. And the last one was um, board uh, games, no? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. board games. So, I mean, I, I don't want to, to um, simplify this, yeah, no? yeah, sure. to make a, a prescription. prescription no? yeah. But um, do, do you think that some kind of um, cultural and, um, activities or cognitive act acti activities are more um, powerful than others? For instance, I don't know, uh, digital stimulation or television instead of reading or writing. Uh, can you make a comment on that because so I mean important. I think broadly one would say that complex cognitive activity complex mental activity okay. which engages your brain actively mm -hmm. and if you're challenging your brain like you're learning something new uh, it's not something repetitive really uh, like going to university again to learn a new language really okay. or learning to dance because dance has uh, involves cognition because you have to learn new moves it involves physical activity also involves social activity so it actually has three components to it, really, in a way. Board games may be important, but if it becomes repetitive, then it's not challenging to the brain. Okay. Watching television is not beneficial. Mm -hmm. If anything, the opposite, really, because it doesn't actively challenge your brain, really. You're a recipient mm -hmm. rather than actively challenged. So I think it's, it's important, I think, for uh, whatever positive effects cognition is going to give us. Mm -hmm. It's really that challenge that is important. And it doesn't matter what activity you do, if that aspect of the challenge is there in it. It could be a, a, any activity that is culturally appropriate, which you enjoy. Because the other element is that you should be able to maintain that. Mm -hmm. And if you don't enjoy something, it's unlikely that you will maintain it over a period of time. You, will, of you may start, start it. it. Like people do computerized tasks, for example, computer 
exercises. Uh, there are many programs available now. You can go online and do some challenging uh, computer activities. But the tr trouble is that often people start it, but they do not maintain it. They find it boring and they give it up after a while. But the important thing is that you not only uh, start it, but maintain it. Because as soon as you stop doing it, the benefit uh, will not necessarily persist. So if I understand uh, well, it is not so much about uh, that some uh, media are better than other, but yeah. uh, more um, engaging into complex activities yeah, that's with right. um, higher levels of activity by in, in the part of who is developing that um, that cognitive yes. task. So, for instance, uh, it could be television, or it could be digital media, or it could be uh, reading and or writing. But uh, whenever you deal with um, new information, new task, learning, yeah, that would become right. yeah, exactly. better yeah. for it. Reading is good, really. Mm -hmm. Reading, of course, also challenges. And you have to remember and uh, reflect on it and go back and um, sort of uh, reconstruct what you had studied before. So reading is good, really. And, but it's probably not the exclusive activity you want to do. There are other kind of, uh, kinds of activities that you want to do as well. Yeah. Now, w one question that often comes um, when one speaks with the general public about um, neuroscience is the issue of um, mm, the brain reserve, you, yeah. you, you talked earlier, but also the, the issue of um, neurogenesis. No? Yeah. Can the neurons be, uh, be born uh, in even in old age people, for example? No? Uh, and is this related somehow to the resilience or the possibility to... to uh, resist um, dementia? So that's, that's a very good question. I think we do know that mammalian brains, even adult brains, do generate new neurons, really. So previously it was thought that once you, you uh, it, uh, kind of born or you, you reach some level of maturity, in, in, as a child, in fact, you have a certain number of neurons and then you, that's it for the rest of your life. You do not form new neurons, really. But now we know that adult brains will form neurons. There are two special <laughs> niches in the brain where new neurons are formed. There has been some dispute as to whether they are functionally important. But now there's emerging evidence that they are functionally important. Much of the work has been done in rodents, in mice and rats, because they're easy to study in the laboratory. But uh, there is evidence in humans as well that neurogenesis is occurring even until later in life, really. And and there is some evidence that uh, some of these activities, but the evidence has come more from physical exercise, mm -hmm. and especially in uh, animal models. Okay. We know, you know that, that physical, physical exercise, exercise, for example, example, in a rat, you can be, it has been shown. In fact, very interesting studies where rats were either put in their regular cages, mm -hmm. which are quite sterile. There is a bit, of, few pellets there and some water, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And other cages where there were lots of toys and bells and whistles, so they could have they had a spinning wheel and they could move up and down and uh, play around. And the rats who were in these enriched environments had more neurogenesis. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so it's a combination of physical activity, of course, and also mental stimulation in those rats which is producing uh, neurogenesis. And it is related to some nerve growth factors that are released, uh, we think possibly, as a consequence of physical exercise and perhaps also mental, ex mental activity that leads to the f development of new neurons. Well, Dr. Perminder Sachsev, thank you very much for all this uh, concept you have shared with us. I think we have uh, summarized decades uh, of uh, clinical practice, research, and a lot of um, a lot of scientific work, so we are very uh, grateful. And I'm going to um, finish the interview and to um, to say a few words for 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 the audience. Um, hasta el momento hemos um, tenido esta conversación con el doctor Perminder Sachsev de Australia, que nos visita desde la ciudad de Sydney, donde él dirige un instituto neuropsiquiátrico relacionado con la práctica clínica de especialidad en enfermedades neurológicas que afectan el cerebro y la mente, pero también dirige eh, importantes proyectos de investigación relacionados con el envejecimiento saludable y el envejecimiento patológico. Hemos eh, visto un tránsito eh, personal que va des desde una eh, migración eh, de su propia persona, desde la India hasta eh, Australia y Nueva Zelanda, donde el doctor tuvo la oportunidad de eh, ver diferentes modelos culturales, incluyendo el modelo de los maoris que él estudió, 
y esto le ha permitido al doctor tener una sensibilidad cultural para entender muchos conceptos, algunos de ellos conceptos culturales o morales, como el concepto de la culpa en la cultura maori, y luego vimos que esto tenía conexiones con otras formas de cultura, que en última instancia son eh, pues determinantes muy importantes del comportamiento individual, pero también lo es las redes cerebrales de nuestro, de nuestro organismo, y las enfermedades que afectan el cerebro y la mente generalmente tienen estos dos componentes, un componente biológico y un componente cultural y social. Eh, y en la segunda parte de la conversación hemos visto cómo esto puede afectarse, sobre todo en las enfermedades tal cual, en los casos clínicos que nos, nos dice el doctor eh, Sachsev que cada caso clínico es una ventana o una oportunidad para entender el funcionamiento del cerebro, porque se vuelven de alguna manera, eh, por así decirlo, experimentos de la naturaleza en los cuales podemos ver qué pasaría si tal o cual módulo cerebral cayera en un proceso de enfermedad y, y en qué forma esto afectaría el comportamiento en general o la experiencia subjetiva de, de, de la persona, ¿no? la emergencia de estados emocionales como la depresión, la ansiedad, los estados de manía, las alucinaciones, todos estos son fenómenos relacionados con esta cadena de causalidad. Finalmente, el doctor nos ha dado alguna guía para entender cómo se investigan las enfermedades del envejecimiento, en particular la enfermedad de Alzheimer, la demencia vascular, y cuáles son los factores de riesgo que pueden llevarnos al desarrollo de esos problemas o a la prevención. Y el doctor ha enfatizado aspectos de dieta, pero también el aspecto de la actividad física y la actividad cognitiva, sobre todo cuando es una actividad física y cognitiva que reta nuestras, nuestra comodidad. Entonces, esperamos que este eh, mensaje del doctor Perminder Sachsev eh, sea de alguna manera de utilidad para que nosotros podamos hacer una reflexión y una autocrítica acerca de cuáles son esas zonas en las que estamos demasiado confortables para poder salir a buscar nuevas formas de aprendizaje. Eh, ha sido un placer estar con ustedes en Pensadores Contemporáneos. Les damos las gracias y eh, con esto terminamos la transmisión. So I want to thank you very much for the interview and also for the invitation to be part of this festival, which uh, has been a brilliant uh, festival, I think. Thank you very much, Dr. Sachs.